everybody. You might have noticed that we are in a state of environmental crisis. We are polluting our air, land and waters like never before. In fact, the scale of environmental degradation is so large that we are at risk of exceeding key environmental limits that define a safe operating space for humanity. An international team of researchers and I projected that if we don't change course, we are at risk of exceeding key planetary boundaries related to climate change, water use, land use, and biogeochemical flows uh, by the year 2050, and some of which more than by 100%. What does exceeding planetary boundaries mean? Well, do you remember last year's heat wave? This is how it looked like where I live in London. Maybe not so bad, you might say. But this is how it looked like in Constante in northwestern Spain, not all that far from here. And you could see similar pictures from places like California. If the planetary boundary for climate change was exceeded even more, then you could expect such extreme weather events like heat waves, wildfires, droughts to, to occur at an increasing rate. So instead of every 10 to 20 years, those could occur every other year or even every year. This picture shows you the current state of deforestation in Indonesia. If the planetary boundary for land use was exceeded more, then it's not only green space that is nice to look at that is at risk, but we risk losing forest ecosystems that regulate uh, our climate and that are home to lots of species that might be lost as a, if we lose those ecosystems. This picture shows you an oxygen depleted dead zone in the Baltic Sea. In such dead zones, algae can still grow, but all fish die because they don't have uh, enough oxygen. There are already over 700 of those dead zones around the world. And with the planetary boundary of biogeochemical flows exceeded more, you can expect more of those dead zones to occur. Now you might ask, what is behind all this? No, it's not Trump, it's our food system. Here's some basic stats for, for you. At the moment, about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions are emitted due to the food system. So it's a major driver of climate change. It, al it also occupies about a third of the uh, Earth's land surface and puts great pressure on uh, forest and biodiversity. It uses more than two thirds of all freshwater resources and puts pressure on local water systems. And the over application of fertilizers has already resulted in dead zones and oceans. Those environmental impacts might increase by 50 to 90% due to, in part, population growth, but to a larger degree due to the expected westernization of diets around the world. And that's not exactly healthy either, as you might guess. So what can we do about it? Well, um, the team of researchers and I put together a global food systems model that connects food consumption and associated health impacts in one region with food production and the associated environmental impacts in other regions. We calibrated the model with high resolution data on land use and water use. We used uh, emissions data of uh, crops and of livestock, and we used data on uh, fertilizer application around the world. We also considered different socioeconomic development pathways that differed in what is assumed, uh, how, how population might grow or, or how, how income might grow. And with this model, we analyzed a couple of different options that included improvements in management practices and technology, reductions in food loss and waste, different socioeconomic developments, uh, and lastly, dietary changes towards healthier and more plant-based diets. Well, the good news is that with our analysis, we found that indeed we could avoid a situation where we exceed all those planetary boundaries and stay within env the environmental limits of our food system. But for that to happen, we basically need to implement all the options we considered. So let's look a bit at the relative contribution of those options to the reductions in environmental impacts. Let's start with technological changes. You can see here they can contribute about 10 to 60 percent to the overall reductions. And they are most efficient for things like fertilizer application, water use and land use. For fertilizer application, they include measures such as better measurement, a more balanced application of fertilizers, 
rebalancing of application between over-applying and under-applying regions, and also better recycling of the nitrogen and phosphorus that are in fertilizers. For freshwater use, measures include better water storage capacity, better water transport systems, and better irrigation systems, especially in low-income countries. For cropland use, the most important thing is to increase yields, which means producing more from a given piece of land uh, than before. And that is particularly a problem for low-income countries, where yields are really dramatically low. The good news is that there are very many low input uh, measures that can in increase yields without requiring crazy amounts of fertilizers or genetically modified crops, for example. Finally, there are options that can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the food system a little bit. Um, options include here changes in what we feed to animals, how we manage manure, uh, how we fertilize crops, and uh, how we plan irrigation. What you can see here also, though, is that those technical options don't reduce emissions all that much. And the reason here is that much of the em emissions associated with uh, the food system are characteristic to specific food, uh, uh, food commodities. For example, you won't ever be able to engineer away completely the methane emissions uh, that cows burp up. Next are changes in food loss and waste. At the moment, we waste about a, uh, a third of all food. So that never reaches either the market and is lost before, or it's wasted at a household level or the, at the retail level. We estimated that halving food loss and waste could reduce the environmental, could contribute about 10 to 20 percent to reductions in environmental impacts. And options that are important here are, for example, better storage and refri refrigeration capacity, again, specifically in low income countries, and business and consumer approaches in high income countries that make people waste less and allow people to buy more quirky food, so to say. Another important but relatively small contribution uh, can improvements in socioeconomic development make. Um, for example, providing access to contraceptives or education in low-income countries, specifically for girls, can make a contribution. But you see here also that it's relatively minor. So population growth is really uh, not that big issue if we look at the environmental impacts of the food system. And indeed, uh, birth rates have already peaked, so we can expect uh, population numbers to stab stabilize sooner or later. What seems to be much more important is how we grow foods, and even more so, what foods we grow and consume. That's also what you see here when you consider the impacts of dietary changes. At the moment, about three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions of the food system are due to animal products, most of which are beef, beef and milk. So dietary changes towards more plant-based diets are really one of the most effective ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions of the food system, and together with uh, decarbonization of the energy system, are really required to avoid dangerous levels of climate change. What you feed to animals also requires lots of land, water, and fertilizers. So those dietary changes can also help reduce those contributions on, on those domains. Now you might ask, what is such a more plant-based diet? Well, we scanned the literature on what constitutes healthy eating, and we constructed a planetary health diet that is both healthy and sustainable, and we think general enough to be adaptable to very many local contexts. Front and center of this diet are fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, and whole grains. And you don't even have to give up meat or, or dairy completely if you don't want to. We estimated that if you limit red meat consumption, and that includes pork and, and beef and lamb, to about one time uh, once per week, you limit, and you limit poultry consumption to twice a week, fish consumption to twice a week, and the rest two days, you are either vegetarian or vegan, then the environmental impacts of your consumption choices would just be reduced enough to stay within the environmental limits in line with what I just showed you. Of course, if you went completely plant-based, you could reduce your emissions and other environmental impacts even more, and that would even be healthier if it's uh, done in a balanced way. But I don't think we need to be ideological here, and any change towards more plant-based diet, diets is an important change. Now, 
how realistic are those dietary changes? So I'm a food systems modeler, and uh, often colleagues of mine tell me, uh, it's really not realistic to assume that lots of people would dramatically change what they eat, especially if it involved giving up meat and milk uh, to a large extent. But I really don't think so, and I'm, so to say, a case study for you that change is possible. When I first uh, came across the scientific evidence on healthy eating some 13 years ago, I decided to change. And I'm from a country that is one of the highest sausage-consuming countries in the world. You might guess which country that is. Um, my thinking was, well, if I can reduce my risk of getting some nasty cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, by some 20 to 30 percent, by just simply changing what I eat, why wouldn't I do that? So I put on my cooking hat and went into the kitchen and experimented until I found something that suited my palate. And what I found was there are really great many examples from all around the world of healthy and plant-based dishes that are tasty, easy to prepare, affordable, and really also quite fun to look at, in fact. What I also found that those very similar dishes were part and are part of cultures around the world with a history of long longevity, such as the uh, traditional Mediterranean culture, the island cultures of Japan, the Adventists of California, and the fusion cultures of the increasing number of vegetarians and vegans around the world. Mm. Now, since I changed my diet, lots of other evidence has become available that shows clearly that such a diet is not only healthy for you, but also healthy for the planet, and indeed required to stay within our environmental limits. What is also increasingly appreciated is that we pretty much change what we eat all the time. Sometimes it's due to what others eat, or what is available, or what is advertised, and most of the time we don't pay much attention to what we eat. Going forward, I don't think we can afford anymore to not pay attention to the environmental impacts we have with our consumption choices on our planet. So please join me and millions around the world in contributing to eating with our environmental limits. Change won't happen without you changing. Thank you very much.